It is really wonderful to be here this evening. And for many, many years, people have known me in my most recent experiences as a pro-life activist. And I am definitely a pro-life activist. But I'm also a civil rights activist, reaching all the way back into the 20th century. And so when I recall all of my life experiences and I look at who I am today and I begin to think about how important it is for all of us to be comfortable in our own skin, whatever our own skin happens to be. There are many battles today about skin color. And uh, as late as 2014, moving into 2015, perhaps on beyond into 2016, the questions will be asked, what's taking so long to resolve all of the issues that cause us to contend because of skin color? My uncle, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., during his lifetime, wanted his children to be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. I would even say now that the content of God's character is what we as human beings must begin to pursue more and to learn more about God, not his acts, mighty acts, parting the Red Sea or healing us today from something or providing for us. Those are wonderful acts of God. But God's ways, God's character, God is not like human beings. God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And so when people ask me to talk now about race, why is there racism in America? Why is there so much injustice in the world? we actually have to go pretty far back in human history to see why that division was allowed to come into humanity and then how it can be removed. I often go back to a quote by my uncle, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Uncle ML, and he said, we must learn to live together as brothers, and I add, as sisters, or perish as fools. But then how can we be brothers and sisters, if we're separate races. And that takes us to Acts 17, 26, and I'm going to pick it up. I've got a parallel Bible with me tonight, King James Version and the uh, modern English Version, but Acts 17 and 26. And if there are any Bible scholars with me tonight, and you could get it on the little devices now. You could, get, you could find the Word. So let's do that together. But Acts 17 and 26 and has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. And I can hear the ladies thinking, oh, well, it's just the men, so that doesn't include us. Well, God made man, male and female. And so together we are the human race and one blood. One of my favorite uh, analogies there and that was a show, Archie Bunker and his wife. And so our, our Archie Bunker was pretty ornery. And nobody wanted to be bothered with him too much, you know. And he had his little Edie running around the house, always in a panic. So Archie became sick one day. And was sick unto death. And he rushed to the hospital and the doctor said, you're going to die if you don't get a blood transfusion. They couldn't find anybody to want to give the man a blood transfusion. Finally, one came forth, and the blood transfusion occurred. And Archie came back to consciousness. Doc, thank you so much. Can I just thank the person who gave me the blood? Now, Archie was Caucasian. In walks African-American George Jefferson. <laughs> Archie falls back on the bed. Doc, can you take the blood back? <laughs> So one blood, it proves, underneath the skin, we really are pretty much the same. But human beings have contended over that point. If we go all the way back in the Bible to Genesis with Noah, Noah got on the boat with his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their wives. And then when they came off of that boat, 
after the mighty flood and the rains and they came off of the boat, Ham founded the, what was known as the African nations, Shem, the Hebraic nations, and Japheth, the Caucasian nations, but they were brothers. They weren't three men from three different sets of parents. So we have to look at that and look at the history. Where did we originate? And before that, we all came from Adam and Eve. And so we're fighting over skin color as if we were separate races. That is a lie of the devil. And when we thought about that, and, and uh, slaves, obey your masters. This is right. But if we go back into Leviticus 25, verse 8, reading from King James, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto you, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto the forty and nine years. And you shall cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, and the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout your land. If we do a Bible study on what Jubilee really was, the slaves were released by the slave masters every seven years with grant, land grants and bonuses and blessings. And so when the uh, Ku Klux Klan, for example, or various racist groups with lack of understanding began to say, well, uh, slaves have to obey their masters. And if you're a slave, then you have to do what I say. I say, well, where's my bonus? Where's my land? Where's my blessing? When we came on into the end of the 20th century into the 21st century, now little children would say to me, Miss Alveda and later Mama King, they would say, a baby's like a slave in the stomach. They wouldn't say womb. In the stomach of his mommy or her mommy, I said, baby, how? I knew where they were going with that. Well, the mommy decides if the baby lives or dies, and the slave master decides if the slave lived or died. And I would say, you know, I don't know why adults don't get that because the analogy is so close and so clear. So we have to live and look out for those who cannot speak for themselves. That's another scripture. Speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And so as we begin to look at that, knowing that we are one human family. My uncle, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uncle ML, my daddy, his brother, Reverend A.D. King, often preached sermons on something called the beloved community. And in the beloved community, all human beings were loved, cherished, and lived equally. Now, did it mean that you didn't preach about sin? No. Did it mean you did not correct people when they were in error? Absolutely no. But judgment did not always mean that you put people out of the church or things. You just corrected that behavior. And so one of the things in the beloved community they would have to teach was that Acts 17, 26. My mother said that to me recently. You keep saying Acts 17, 26, one blood. Your daddy always said that. So that wasn't a new revelation to me. <laughs> But I now, as a mature Christian, am understanding that scripture so much more. I thought about, uh, and I, I would ask this question, and my children who would travel with me when I was speaking, and I would end up asking people, what race am I? And everybody says, you don't know? You're an African American. Yes, I do know that. But my granddaddy's grandfather, there's a family tree in this book, and Nathan Branham King was born in Cork, Ireland. I've been to Ireland twice. I took my daughters over there with me one time. And so Nathan was a Caucasian man from Ireland. That's Daddy King's grandfather. Mama King, Daddy King's wife, her grandfather was a slave preacher. He was such a good preacher that the slave masters came over to his church to hear him preach, you see? And so I would ask, and then we found out about Square Reese, my mother's Cherokee father. So I, here I am, part African, part Irish, and part Native American. So then I say, what, what, what race am I? The answer really is the same race as you, human. And as I look out here, I can see various ethnicities in all of us. 
when I was born, I had, my skin was even more fair than this, and I had strawberry blonde hair. Daddy King told my mother not to abort me, because she thought about that. And he said, she has bright skin and bright red hair, and she's gonna bless many people. I was born with very fair skin and strawberry blonde hair. Now, I admit this is sort of like Miss Clairol or something here. <laughs> my hair is white today. But in honor to granddaddy, I, you know, I just hold it all to a little bit longer. My mother's hair is beautiful, totally white, gorgeous hair. And so we look at, and that came from her Cherokee heritage. My mother could sit on her hair when she was young. It was that long and that straight. The high cheekbones, you see? Uh, the African fig features that, that we have, the various figures, features that come in our family. When I was a little girl, when I was born, my two brothers were born next, and they had beautiful brown skin, the most gorgeous skin. My grandmother had that beautiful, Mama King, that beautiful ebony rich skin. Most, the most beautiful people I'd ever seen. And my brothers, you sure are funny looking, you're pale. Where did they get you? You must be adopted. <laughs> and I would cry because why can't I look like everybody else? So my Aunt Woody, Daddy King's sister, she said, honey, some of our people came from over the sea, not on slave boats, but they were in Ireland. And she tried to explain it to me for a long time. We didn't know, but I was so happy to find my African re roots on the west coast of Africa, down in the uh, slave caverns in Ghana, and then Ireland, which was also a diaspora, because Irish people, when they got here, sometimes were very mistreated as well. And then the Native Americans were mistreated. So here the king blood comes from three groups of freedom fighters. So is there a surprise that Martin Luther King talked about us being one blood, one community? So now another part of that, in the 1950s, Dr. Billy Graham, who I admire very, very, very much, he said, I am tired of doing segregated church meetings, evangelistic outreach. I'm not going to do it anymore. As a matter of fact, I'm going to call this man, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to come to Madison Square Garden and preach with me. Billy Graham and Martin Luther King, there's a picture. You can find it out there in cyberspace somewhere, standing next to an airplane. Martin Luther King went to stand and preach with Dr. Billy Graham in New York. During that same time was when he was, Uncle ML was stabbed in the chest by a deranged woman that didn't understand his message. And she didn't agree with his message. But Dr. Graham and Dr. King preached together. Martin Luther King Jr. even later wrote in a letter from Birmingham jail, the most segregated hour in America is Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Because back then, it's still all sort of like that, although people do go to various churches together now. Dr. Graham was criticized so much by his own peers. Why would you go and preach in a pulpit with that? He got, he received challenges from his own peers. So we've been fighting this skin color battle, a lie from Satan that we are separate races. I want to share just a few more words out of my book, King Rules, in the Fight for Justice uh, Rule, Rule 6. Problems don't go away because you stop looking at them. The progress made in a place like Harlem, which is in the midst of an impressive revival with many local businesses prospering, doesn't offset the profound woes in too many of our inner cities and rural areas. If we truly want the justice my family has already fought, always fought for, then we can never be satisfied that things are marginally better. Now, looking into this century now, things are much better, not even just marginally. I can remember young people, when I was a little girl, there were white water fountains and colored water fountains. There was a restaurant in Atlanta at a department store called Rich's. Rich's finally merged with Macy's, and now it's just Macy's. But there was the beautiful magnolia room. And the uh, Caucasian ladies would bring their friends or their little daughters or granddaughters, and they would eat in this beautiful tea room. The African-American uh, servers were serving them and everything. And my grandmother, who had just as much money as anybody who was in the tea room, 
and we'd go. And she says, honey, we can't go in there. And I was like, why? We're colored. I said, well, they look kind of pink. <laughs> I did say that. I hope that didn't bother anybody. I'm saying, so what do you mean colored, you know? And we would have to go down in the basement in this little tiny place that had some of the menu items, but not the same. So I remember days like that. I remember the stories that my own daddy, A.D., and Uncle Emil would tell and Aunt Christine, and there was one in particular. They lived in a community that was blended. On one side of the street, you had the Caucasians, on the other side, the blacks, and different families lived in the area. But the little children went and played on the same play playground. They played baseball, softball and baseball. So one day, the little Caucasian boys that had been playing with them for a long time said, ML, AD, we can't play with you anymore. And they said, what, why? You're colored. <laughs> and they were like, well, everybody has some color because that's the way we already always thought. So Uncle ML went home. They were all disturbed by it, but Uncle ML went to his mama, Mama King, big mama. Mother dear, why is that? And she says, ML, it shouldn't be that way and it won't always be that way. And he looked up at her, Aunt Christine said, and said, Mother dear, one day I'm going to turn this world upside down. So he was so disturbed about those injustices all of his life. And he did everything he could, scripturally, biblically, and loving others, not being violent, to end this injustice. So, you know, my mother always often says, Naomi, Naomi Ruth Barbara King, my mother, she says, hatred has to be taught. Babies do not come out of the womb hating people. It has to be taught. So obviously, if it can be taught, it could be untaught. That's probably not a word, is it? <laughs> but we can teach people not to hate. But we actually have to teach that. And that's not enough of that happening. Even here in the 21st century with Ferguson and Sanford and Staten Island and all the rioting and accusations of racism and all of that. We must teach people to love. Uncle ML even wrote a book, Strength to Love. The word says, now abide faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. It says, love never fails. But if we're not teaching people to love, if we're not building a beloved community. Now, something else I learned recently, and I thought about it, and it made so much sense. We've always talked about equal opportunity. But we can have opportunity if there's no access. Then what is sought is never delivered. We have to have access. Many times, decisions are made and opportunities become access and reality in, uh, in, in uh, family clubs, neighborhood associations, on the golf course, at the bowling alley where people who bowl, bowl at the same alley. Uh, your son graduated from college. Is your daughter graduating next year? Well, they're going to be opening up some opportunities at my place. But see, we don't share each other's church services enough. We don't go into each other's homes enough. And so there's no access. Even if we shop in the same stores, we walk down the aisle, and if we see somebody who doesn't quite look like us, we go over to another aisle until they leave that aisle, unconsciously. And when I say we, that's not a black thing, that's not a white thing. That's happening in various communities. So we do not make ourselves accessible to each other. And therefore, the opportunities never become reality. They don't manifest. So um, what, what this comes down to is rallying our resources. My uncle was absolutely right. We have no shortage of human resources. We do not. We only need to put them to the best possible use. For those of us who are living well, it means giving back to our communities, offering chances and guidance to those who are starving. We need to give them chances to contribute. I, I really was listening to the news reports and various things, and I see the reactions. If there were access, 
beyond the opportunities for young people like Michael Brown or Eric Garrett. Now this, this really happened recently. There was a lady shoplifting in a grocery store and she was trying to steal a dozen eggs. The police came and she was apprehended and arrested. For some reason, the officer asked the lady why she was trying to steal the eggs. And she said, the people at home are hungry. So believe it or not, and this is just, it's really kind of an odd scenario and I'm trying to see where God's gonna let all of this play out. He actually bought the eggs, made sure the eggs got back to the lady's house and then the lady was arrested and taken on to, you know, answer those charges. Sometimes, you know, people will do criminal or wrong things for greed, sometimes feeling that they're entitled and actually sometimes they need something. So we have to look at the elements that are causing a society to do these things. And if we actually think about the devaluation of human life, if I don't value the life of an older elderly person, if I don't value the life of the baby in the womb, if I don't value the life of a sick person, then what's wrong with me creating a product that's gonna make me rich, but it's gonna turn your mortgage upside down and you end up foreclosed, but I've got money in the bank. You see, greed and entitlement are doing that. That's not need that does that. But then someone who's hungry or needs something, and they say, well, I want to, Christmas is coming. I want to buy my mother a present. I don't have any money. Let me run and steal something. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. Should not happen. But we have to sometimes wonder and look at what's happening outside of our own sphere. Even Jesus said this when he was uh, speaking to the people. And he said to his disciples, you need to feed the people. We can't keep them here all these hours and days and not feed them. Their bodies will faint and perish. So even though we're giving eternal spiritual life and words, they also need to eat. So we have to look around now and try to understand what's happening. There's another quote. I was speaking to someone right before we began the session, and we were talking about the darkness that's in our land and in our nation. This quote's on, actually on the back of the book. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. But I wrote a book several years ago, and it was God's Plan for the Black Man, and then around 2008, I changed the name of it, and it became Who We Are in Christ Jesus. But uh, at first I was looking, you know, who are we? Are we black? Are we colored? Are we Negro? Are we, because we've been called so many things while our com African American community has been in America, so people needed to know who we were. And then I wrote the hue, H U in parentheses, man, the human race is colored. Nobody's pale, white, or total ebony without magentas or reds or the flush tones of the pink, everybody has color. So black and white is not even true. We are fighting. People were so excited. We, we elected a president with brown skin. And I had relatives and friends, don't tell me about your abortion stuff. Don't talk to me about uh, natural marriage. Yes, we can. I said, okay. I said, but the people I asked God for a king. And God said, you need a king? You have me. We need a king. He said, I'll give you a king. It's not going to be what you think. So they got King Saul. And then we know how that happened. So I'm thinking, and that's not an indictment against the president of the United States or anything like that. But I said, so you're voting for skin color. And later people actually admitted to me, yes, I actually did vote for skin color. At first they didn't want to admit it. Then they said they did. And I could understand that because even with Moses, God told Moses, to go and lead the people out. And, and Moses said, they're not going to even listen to me. They've been so cruelly oppressed. They've been so mistreated by their slave masters. They're not going to hear this. And God understood all that, of course. So I'm, I'm looking. I said, so 
Planned Parenthood helped to elect the president and said, give us more money. Planned Parenthood gets over a million dollars a day from our own tax dollars. Uh, the homosexual community said, endorse gay marriage. He said, okay. The African-American community wanted to say, give us black skin. President Obama could not give us black skin. God gave him his skin. No human gave him his skin. So I'm saying, what did we ask for? Did we ask for access to jobs? Did we ask for better education? You know, so here we are with skin color. But it wasn't only African Americans that voted for our president. Many people did because people wanted hope. People wanted change. But transformation, didn't the Bible say, don't put your confidence in horses and chariots? Didn't Proverbs say, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding? Now, this may be a bad analogy. I don't know. It's a song. We don't need another hero. And it came from a certain movie a long time ago. But people are always looking for a hero when we have the Lord. People honestly need the Lord. So we have to turn away from looking for human solutions. And we need to find the Lord. So I, I just wanted to share with us the beloved community. The Bible says, beloved, love one another because love is of God. Jesus prayed that we all would be one so that the world would know us by that love. And it genuinely is true. Skin color will fail you. Hair color will fail you. Eye color will fail you. How much you weigh will fail you. But love never fails. Praise the Lord.